We have a panel of experts and they are ready to answer your questions on dealing with death and loss. That's our topic as we're set to go live with Call the Doctor right now. Hello, and welcome to Call the Doctor. Live from Republic Media Studios, I'm Joe Krobach. We don't like to think about it, but the day may come when someone you love dies. The death of a loved one is ranked among the most severe trauma we encounter in our lives and has the potential to shatter our world. The sense of loss and grief which follows is a natural and important part of life. It is not a sign of weakness, but rather a healthy and appropriate response. Death is the most permanent loss we face but there are other forms of loss that can be devastating as well. Two of the most common situations where children face a sense of loss are when they move and if their parents divorce. And according to a 1990 study by the U.S. Census Bureau, approximately one in 20 children in the United States experience the loss of a parent before they reach the age of 18. The more significant the loss, the more intense the grief can be. However, even subtle losses can lead to grief. Grief can occur after moving away from home, graduating from college, changing jobs, selling your family home, or retiring from a career you loved. Bereavement may cause some short or long-term changes in your family or other relationships and may cause you to temporarily close yourself off from others. We don't realize how much we need companionship until we are faced with being alone. Maybe that's why we're afraid to reach out to others, because we fear that they won't understand what we're going through. We're going to ask you now to, to see the number on the bottom of your screen and call in your questions or go online at wvia.org and click on the link at the top of the page where it says submit questions. We've assembled regional experts and they are ready to answer your questions tonight on dealing with death and loss. Our first guest is Dr. Robert Yanishak from Geisinger Health Systems, hospit hospitalist and palliative care medicine physician. Our next guest is Dr. Frank Maffei, Geisinger Health Systems, Pediatric Critical Care. Also joining us is Dr. Alexander Nesbitt, Susquehanna Health Medical Director, Hospice and Palliative Care Services. And our last guest is Dr. Vincent J. Vanston, Institute of Palliative Medicine. What makes Call the Doctor so very unique is the ability for you to interact live with our region's finest experts for an hour as we go beyond the trendy news soundbite and offer real information and help for you and your family so those toll-free lines are open right now, and you can give us the call. So take the opportunity and ask your questions about dealing with death and loss. Thank you all for coming today. Dr. Vance, and I want to start with you and ask you a question of why do we all grieve? Well, I, I think what you described, Joe, in the introduction made the most sense. I mean, I think people do grieve. It's a normal reaction, and I think it's a human reaction to any form of loss. I think in the field of palliative medicine, what we try to pay attention to is, is this normal grieving, which is the normal process by which people gradually adapt to loss and over time kind of re-engage and re-emerge as a new person and connect with, with uh, their family and friends and society? Or is this complicated grief where they become, it becomes more and more persistent, it lasts longer over time, that they are struggling with intrusive thoughts, with rumination about whatever their loss was or the loss of their loved ones, where they develop depressed symptoms that persist and they're unable to break through that. I think that's the kind of grief that we get concerned about. Well, that brings me to a better question. Why do we all grieve in different ways? I mean, nobody's taught us how to grieve. I mean, we, we learn to walk and talk from our parents, and sometimes they don't teach us how to grieve properly. But why do we all do it in different ways? Is that just a, a release of, of ourselves that we find in ourselves to, to learn how to grieve? Anyone? I think it's just a reflection of our individuality and the the relationship we have with the person that we've lost. Um, I think it's really true. Everybody does grieve differently, and sometimes I've seen that um, as a source of problem. Um, two parents lose a child, and the, the wife is very out there with her grief, crying, and the, the dad is just quiet and withdrawn. It may feel to her that he's not feeling the loss as much. 
um, he may feel that she's kind of pushing him to express in a different way than what's normal for him. So it's really individual. And I imagine age, does age play a little bit to it? I actually have a, a saying, a quote I'd like to read about this if I could. Uh, the difficult changes that many elderly or older adults face, face, such as the death of a spouse or medical problems, can lead to depression. But depression is not a normal or necessary part of aging. In fact, most seniors are satisfied with their lives despite the challenges of growing old. Left alone, depression not only prevents older adults from enjoying life, it can also take a heavy toll on their health. So, I mean, that's kind of sad that you're not only feeling depressed, now it's going to debilitate your, your health in that. Uh, I'm sure that makes it a lot more difficult, but why is it that a child who, again, doesn't know how to grieve properly, and an adult is actually willing to hurt themselves internally for their grieving process? Speaking for children, um, you know, children, again, grieve very differently, very individually, um, but their grieving process is really dependent upon where they're at in a developmental uh, standpoint. Um, an infant and, or even a toddler certainly cannot begin to understand the concept of death, um, but they may be affected by grief. They may sense that something is wrong if uh, the mother or father has lost a loved one, maybe a grandparent has passed. So even the smallest child can be affected by grief, even though they may have a limited understanding of grief. As a child gets older, uh, around school age, then the understanding of death um, is a little better grasped. And the main thing that children have a tendency to have difficulty with is the permanency of death. And um, oftentimes it's not until a school age child can begin to understand that this is something that is not reversible, uh, that they really start to begin to get the gravity of what it is to have lost a loved one. I find uh, uh, when I'm dealing with adult patients uh, and, and as a hospitalist and as a palliative care doctor, we deal with grief differently based on spiritual background, uh, cultural backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And um, in, this, in this area, we have a multicultural uh, population. And it's interesting to see how different nationalities will grieve differently right. Right. and express their grief. Um, some nationalities are very vocal. Some are just laid back. Some are, they just do it internally. And it's very interesting to me. And you have to connect with each one of those people differently. And you have to try to understand what their grieving is all about so that you can help them in getting through that time, that difficult time. One of the interesting things we've learned with people who are going through bereavement is the fact that it does have a significant impact on their health. And when you're talking about the elderly before, um, obviously they have less reserve physiologically and less reserve, sometimes less social support and structure around them. But we do know that, that during that period of bereavement and loss that patients will often come in to the doctor, see them more frequently. There's increased risk of alcohol or their drug uh, use. There's also just more chance of other issues or you know, met, uh, high blood pressure, or taking their medication, right, all those things can fall off during that period. So it, it is a, a risk, risky period for, for the elderly. Uh, while we're on the elderly, how long does it take for one to grieve? Uh, there's not one yeah. set time period. <laughs> um, I think a lot of times that's somewhat of a misconception that people who are around the bereaved person feel that there's a normal time when you should cry and be sad, and then if it's been six months, you know, you should be over this. Mm -hmm. And it isn't like that, that you grieve and then you stop grieving. Um, grieving gradually changes the way that it is, um, how often you're disabled from being able to get through the day. But um, I'm very aware that people can feel as intense sadness two years mm -hmm. after the loss, mm -hmm. five years after the loss of their loved one, just not quite as often, just not quite as, as bad. But um. People have said uh, in those situations where it lasts a little bit longer than you would expect, uh, the term pathological uh, grieving or bereavement, and recognizing that person so that you can help them per perhaps with mm -hmm. their depression and, and staying away from things that will hurt them uh, and getting them into support groups that will help them through that process. And um, I recently uh, encountered uh, a, um, uh, 
young man who died and his, his spouse just has had a very difficult time, is not accepting phone calls mm -hmm. even though I've offered that and it's a very difficult time for her, particularly around the holidays. Um, you have to identify those people and make them make sure they're connecting. I think con the connection is, is, is individual. It could be a spiritual connection or they're religious, if they have a religious background or getting a hold of their relatives, loved ones, and actually getting involved in getting them through that, uh, that period a little bit better if they have someone who understands them and loves them. Dr. Nisbet, I have a question about that. Do, do older people grieve in a different process? We said it takes uh, no amount of time, but as we're younger and do we, as we get older, does it become a little easier after we've grieved several times uh, through our lifetime? Do we learn from that? I, I don't think so. I am not aware of any data that says older people grieve less or better than younger. Um, I mean, I am just aware that as I care for people, a 75-year-old person who has lost his wife, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. intensity of their sadness and the hardness of it is every bit as much as a 30-year-old person. Mm -hmm. um, even though the 75-year-old, to everybody around, they'd say, well, this person had a long life and it's a natural thing, an older person would die. But if it's your loved one, um, it doesn't change how hard it mm -hmm. burns inside. So it still hurts at any age? Mm -hmm. I think so. All right, well, I think we're going to go to a, a phone call right now. We're going to talk to Anita in Wilkes-Barre. Anita, you're on the show. Go ahead, Anita. Um, my husband died, like, oh, almost over 10 months ago, and I feel like, I feel like my heart was ripped out, and, um, angry at the world and like lost. Well, sorry to hear about your loss, Anita. Um, I don't think you should feel lost and we're going to give you some ideas on how to be supportive at this time. Does anybody have any direct advice for Anita first before we go over the do's and don'ts of how to support someone? Um, again, condolences um, for Anita uh, with her loss of her husband. Um, the one thing, I think you're right, Joe, um, it's, it's not uncommon to feel lost um, early in the bereavement process. It's not uncommon to have, you know, these incredibly deep feelings of despair. Um, my wife was describing that, you know, when she recently lost her sister, that there was a place of mourning that she didn't even know she had. It was a, so deep was the anguish and the pain. So the feelings that Anita is having now, I think, are not uncommon. Um, but um, what we as, uh, as professionals and her family and so forth are hopefully there for, to do is to sort of support her through that process. Um, it's, it's, it seems unimaginable, you know, especially if, um, um, in my experience in talking to, to parents of uh, uh, parents who've lost their children or lost a child, that it seems unimaginable that that pain is ever going to go away. It just it doesn't seem possible. Um, and what doesn't go away is the sense of loss. You know, you don't, as Dr. Nesbitt said, you don't ever get over it. Um, you get through the grieving process, but that loss becomes integral to who you are. You will always have been married to this wonderful man who you lost. What the emotions tend to uh, happen over time is the intensity of the despair may lessen. You may actually start to feel emotions of warmth and memories of that person where the absolute despair that you're feeling early in the bereavement process may be sort of um, lessened over time. But um, it is uh, not uncommon early on, and they, I think our palliative experts here would I mean, the other thing I would say is just from a practical standpoint, I think some practical advice is to connect with your primary care physician, to use counselors if, they, if they're recommended. Um, at times there may be a role for antidepressant as well, just to help you gain enough energy to get through the day and engage. Um, you know, again, a lot of these are kind of not so much evidence-based as what, what our experience has been. And I think one of the things I've seen is when people 
withdraw from the world and close in, I think that's, that's a very difficult period for them. I think that as much as possible to maintain connection and to use their family network, social network, friends to kind of re-engage in the world and to stay participating. But I think the important thing uh, from, from listening to Anita is the idea that you need to stay involved with your physicians, stay involved with the people who can help you, stay involved with family. Uh, because they will. It is a process and it does take time. And um, it, there's no easy way through it, but there is, eventually you'll come to the other side. Well, Dr. Vanson, you mentioned antidepressants in there, and that's actually one of the questions I did have. Uh, can antidepressants, antidepressants help with grief? And when should you seek you know, a counselor or your physician to get that help? When do you know you've crossed the line that an antidepressant might be what you need to get through that, through the moment? I, I would like to hear the other people on the panel as well, uh, what their thoughts are about it. Um, I think that uh, certainly evaluation from your primary care physician is critical. I think that um, when a person has what they call vegetative signs of depression, lack of energy, um, sleeping or not sleeping well at night, um, loss, you know, even if they do, or oversleeping, if they rest and then wake up in the morning completely exhausted. Um, if there's not enough energy to engage in the world, I think that's the role of an antidepressant. Now, I am not, uh, personally, I'm not a believer that a pill alone is going to solve the problem, but I think it can help give the person enough energy to engage in counseling, to engage in, in activity, to get enough rest so that they have enough energy to reserve to participate. But I'd be curious. Dr. Murphy, what? Uh, Dr. Nesbitt? Yeah, I think that's right. I, I think um, certain things are clues um, that you may actually be depressed, not just grieving, and medicine may have a role. Um, somebody who is feeling a persistent sense of hopelessness, there's no hope for the future and a persistent sense of what medically we call anhedonia, which means there's nothing that I enjoy. M my time with my children, the things that I used to have some enjoyment in, there's nothing that I enjoy. If there's that sort of sense that's persistent day after day, that is somewhat worrisome that depression may be there. Well, you mentioned hopelessness. I think that's when I hear that the patients don't have hope for the future, I key in on that, and that person particularly, I would say, may benefit from a antidepressant. And I, you asked, the, we have to ask the more difficult questions, have you thought of hurting yourself? Uh, and um, it, it's okay to ask those questions because that patient uh, in front of you uh, has come to trust you and uh, you're, using, you're at their advocate. But, um, uh, you know, you can do some scales in, the, in our offices, but talking to the patient, you can get a feel for which one would benefit from an antidepressant. But you have to ask those very difficult questions to get a feel for it and ask uh, the questions that Dr. Nesbitt uh, alluded to. Uh, but hopelessness is one key question that I ask. Have you have hope for the future? Is, are things going to get better? Is the sun going to shine for you again? And if they say, I really don't feel that, uh, you, that, that brings uh, brings me to perhaps writing an antidepressant and following that patient more carefully and getting them some support and perhaps getting some psychiatric care or psychological care. I do want to go back to the phones and just to let anyone know at home that's watching, if you would like to call in and be anonymous, you can feel free to do that for this topic. We will gladly accept your calls. Is Anita still with us? Anita is probably not with us right oh. now, but I have another question while we're on the, depres uh, the antidepressants. Does depression and grief have to necessarily come in tandem? Do they keep together or can they remain separated? I think grief is a normal part of loss and, and grief can feel overwhelming and um, makes you so sad. Depression is different. You feel depressed when you're grieving, but a clinical depression is not the same thing as grief. Um, for people who are grieving in a normal way and working their way through this terrible loss, the vast majority of those people do not need medicine. They need time and support and love and care. For somebody who has gotten into a clinical depression where they persistently c can't sleep, they have no hope, they have thoughts of self-harm that they can't shake, those people, it's beyond just grief. This is depression and many of those people do need help. Can we often talk with um, even patients who are dying, you know, in palliative medicine, we often speak, you know, when I teach residents and medical students, one of the questions I always ask is, is normal for these people to be depressed? And usually they say, of course, they should be depressed. And the truth of the matter is, depression is not normal, even people who are dying. And uh, they may grieve, 
just like <laughs> just like anyone else, they're grieving the loss or their anticipated loss of their life. But it's not. But depression is never normal. Entirely. We'll get back or to some more of this, but let's go back to the phones and start answering some calls here. Let's talk to Diane and Holly. Diane, you're on the air. Go yes, ahead. I yep. have a question to ask. Okay. Um, I have a situation that I don't know if this fits in your category, but um, I'm here. I'd like to. I just turned on your show. I never knew it existed, so I'm kind of happy if this works out. I have a son that and family. Uh, and I haven't seen him in six years over a stupid fight at Christmas. So I have tried to, gr I have grieved a lot, I have cried a lot, and we have tried, my husband and I have tried everything possible, sending gifts, say whatever it was, let's talk about it. But I have ha been the one that is, it, it's like grieving for death. Like the death, that's the only way I seem to be able to get through this, that he's dead and his family is dead. Is that normal? Dr. Yeah, Nesbitt? It, it sounds like it is a grief. The loss of relationship that you've had, that can hurt like the, the loss of a loved one. And I empathize with how hard that is. I must tell you, as I take care of families for many years being a family physician and now taking care of people who are coming to their dying time, I have had a number of times where families where there's been a breach in relationship for years, there is the hope that it can be um, renewed. And I've seen that where people have broken their relationship and 20 years later um, can love each other and forgive each other and it can be healed. So I hope that you are able to achieve that, but I empathize with the hurt that you feel. Let's go back to the phones. We do have a, an anonymous phone call from Ahrensburg. Go ahead, you're on the line. Uh, you're on the air. Okay. Your question? Uh, how long does it take for the, uh, the grieving process? As, you know, it's almost two years, and it's just like some days you just feel like nothing's there, uh, giving up, and then the next fun. That's a great question. We did talk about there was no actual timeline to the grieving process, but is two years a good time to, to, to start to think you should feel some resolve for, for the grief portion? You know, I would think um, the fact that two years after your loss, you're still having times of intense sadness and loss, feeling just as hurtful as it was early, that is really normal and a reflection of the, um, the loss that you've had. But if more than a year after the loss, you find you can't engage in things that you enjoy, you're withdrawn, you're not able to function in a normal way, that, that is worrisome. So um, having times of sadness, even years later, is normal. But if you find you can't function in a normal way, um, that, that would be worrisome that it could be more complex. That brings me back to something else, seeing it's two years later. Can that turn into depression because of grief? Uh, again, they don't necessarily go together, but can years procrastinatively make you want to become more depressed about the fact and, and reliving the moment? Well, f for example, I think if even a year after the death, if somebody finds, I can't sleep, I'm losing weight, I can't eat, I never socialize, I would be worried that this is not just grief, but that this may be depression or complicated grief. We talk about the grief that's a normal part of loss, and then complicated grief, which really needs to be assessed by a physician to see if additional help is needed. Uh, how about the different types of loss? Predictable loss versus, you know, of course, an unexpected loss. I mean, uh, a lot of you are in palliative care, so you, I'm sure predictable loss is a little more in line, but there's the unexpected loss that occurs that we're, we're unprepared for, that, that hits us like a train wreck. Is there a difference of how we actually grieve for both uh, forms? Is, does one hit us worse than the other? I think it, uh, it depends on the patient uh, or the, and the situation. Oftentimes uh, in palliative care, uh, it's not a, the wrong, it's the wrong word saying it's a relief, but the patient in front of you, can, you can prepare them. You know, unfortunately, this disease is progressing and uh, we don't see 
that this is going to have a good result and it gives them time to prepare for their death with their family and their loved ones. Um, and they can take care of the things that they wanted to take care of and perhaps the conversations that they wanted to have before that they now, they, they, they sense an urgency. So sometimes it's, it's more difficult when uh, someone is struck down and it's acute pain and acute grief. Uh, so there's, there's, there is a positive aspect of knowing that, you know, I'm not going to be on this world and this transition from this life to the next is going to be short uh, versus another acute grief or acute loss. There also are um, certain kinds of loss that are more associated with higher risk for complicated grief. So um, if you have lost a loved one by suicide, um, a sudden unexpected death, um, a traumatic death, death of a child, death of someone with whom you have a complicated relationship, for example, a wife who uh, suddenly loses her abusive husband who feels the sadness and loss, but the relationship is complicated. These are some of the risk factors that we worry about for that person who has now lost their loved one in one of these ways. There's higher risk that they will have beyond normal grief, but this complicated grief. Um, we're going to go to our online. We actually have a question that came in on the... Uh uh, the, the online portion of our site. Uh, my teenage daughter recently lost her boyfriend of a year in a tragic accident in which she was also injured. She has lost all interest in activities and school. How can I help her? That's, that's from Kingston who writes that in. Anybody have any advice on how we could help her? I would sort of echo the, the panel's uh, recommendations that um, in order for um, a person to be assessed as far as where they are in the grieving process and whether or not they are um, at a risk point in the grieving process, whether or not their grief is now becoming complicated or maybe have a, a depression uh, component to it. It's important for that young lady to be uh, in contact with her primary care physician, um, with a palliative expert, you know, a grieving expert, grieving counselor to sort of better delineate, you know, the process that she's going through because there might be some very normal processes that she's working through, but unfortunately, uh, children are at risk for um, complicated grief. So uh, the availability of an expert would be essential. I always get concerned when you hear, you know, persons withdrawing from the world and not participating over time. You know, over time, you'd you would like to see as, as the primary care physician that there's a gradual engagement and will more participation, developing new relationships, mm -hmm. developing new friends, taking part in the world. If you see the person pulling back, especially if it's lasting a longer and longer time, I think you get more concerned. The other thing I was going to suggest is if there is a support group for other teens that have loss, mm -hmm. that can be hugely important for all people who have loss, it, sometimes it just feels like you've got a, a pain that nobody understands. And kids really feel that as well, especially teenagers. And often the adult's ability to relate to the teenager is not the same as if you have a grieving teen who is sitting in a room with other teens who have had a loss. And the kid feels like, boy, this person is feeling what I feel. It really um, can be very helpful. So. The other component is, you know, um, survivor guilt, you know, that, um, you know, someone is spared um, in a terrible accident and the loved one is, has um, passed because, have died because of the accident. Uh, oftentimes that survivor, on top of having to work through the grieving process, is now also having to work through guilt, whether it be real or imaginable. But uh, again, something that can be helped with counseling and uh, intervention with a professional. We are going to go over some do's and don'ts of supporting and children and adults uh, later in the show. But for now, guys, we're already at the halfway point. So for more information on dealing with death and loss, you can contact Geisinger at geisinger.org, or you can contact Susquehanna Health at susquehannahealth.org, or you can contact the Institute of Palliative Medicine at iopmpc.org. And are you feeling depressed, alone, or helpless? You can call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK or 8255. 
It's a free 24-hour hotline available to anyone in suicidal crisis or emotional distress. Your call will be routed to the nearest crisis center near you. To contact Call the Doctor, your comments or questions, email us at contactctd at wvia.org. Let me reintroduce our panel members to you. Our first guest is Dr. Robert Janicek from Geisinger Health Systems, hospitalist palliative care physician. Our next guest is Dr. Frank Maffei, Geisinger Health Systems Pediatric Critical Care. Also joining us is Dr. Alexander Nesbitt from the Susquehanna Health Medical Director, Hospice and Palliative Care Services. And our last guest is Dr. Vincent J. Vanson, Institute of Palliative Medicine. If you have any questions on dealing with death and loss, call us at the number on the bottom of your screen or go to the WVIA.org and click the link to submit questions. Um, guys, I have a question about how does trauma affect the grieving process? Tra uh, trauma is one of the risk factors for um, complicated bereavement, um, especially if the trauma has caused disfigurement of the loved one. Um, so trauma and traumatic death, both by virtue of being a sudden unexpected loss, and if it's a disfiguring um, event, um, can complicate it. I think we're gonna go back to some of the phones where we're just starting to back up a little bit here. Let's talk to Mary in Shavertown. Mary, you're on the air. Yes, um, my husband passed away 20, uh, seven years ago. He passed away. Uh, it was a suicide. He uh, shot himself in our home. And I've been diagnosed with uh, PTSD and uh, clinical depression. And it just doesn't, uh, it's the guilt that seems to bother me the worst is that I tried to get him help. I took him to the hospital, and they said he wasn't—he wasn't didn't fit their criteria to be taken in. And the next day, he shot himself at, in our home. And it's just does the guilt ever get better? Mary, sorry about your loss. Um, does anyone have any? We talked about survivor guilt. Is this uh, a case of survivor guilt where she's? feeling that she's at some fault uh, to the situation that she no longer has control of? I think one of the things that makes um, loss of a loved one by suicide um, so hard is that feeling and those who are left behind so often have that sense, I should have seen it, I should have done something different. Um, I understand how, how hard that is. and. Um, it does gradually get better, but I think it's so important to continue to be um, seeing the physician or getting the help to work that through. Um, that's just part of the unique pain of suicide. Let's go. Oh, do you have something? I, I'm just, I, I was going to echo the comments. I think the other thing we know is, I mean, any loss, oftentimes, even when it's not a suicide, families will describe what is the equivalent of a post-traumatic stress, that the, the trauma of the event or the sequence of events was so traumatic. So I think that it's also something we see universally. Let's go back to the phones. I believe we have Cora in Rome. Cora, you're on the air? Yes. Go ahead, your question, Cora? Yes. Um, I lost my husband in November, and uh, I'm going through an awful bad time because now I've lost my dog, too, and he was my husband's dog. And it just seems like everything is going wrong around here, and I'm trying to keep up with things. A car went on me, and I, I've called my doctor, and uh, I have an appointment in uh, January to go to the doctors, but I just feel like I can't sleep. I can't. I can't seem to, to cope anymore. It's like I'm getting weaker and weaker. And I was just wondering if there's anything you could do to, to talk to me or help me. Cor, very sorry about your loss. It's the same as the pet. We're actually going to talk a little bit later. We could bring this up now while Cor brings it up. Um, with the pet, I mean, is it okay to have a funeral for your pet? I mean, I know this was Cor going through more of a tr you know, traumatic experience with, with the several losses, but she does bring us to a good topic. People find that their pets are part of their family. I mean. Isn't that, too, a way of a loss in their lives? And, you know, again, should they embrace that, perhaps? I mean, what if their, their friends and peers are, are looking down at them for 
the fact that they want to embrace that moment. I mean, we're well, still trying to be supportive of them. Dr. Vance? I think the important thing is not to minimize what the person's experience is. I mean, I think there's things that we, we know as physicians not to say. You know, oh, you'll get over that. Oh, it's just a matter of time. You know, you, it's time to move on, or it was just your pet, or it was just your, you know, whatever uh, person you know, they, they were related to. So I, I think that the important thing is to recognize the, the grief itself and uh, what that person's experiencing. Core, I, I really feel so, so sorry for you at this time. And it seems that you're trying to reach out for help, but yet your physician uh, won't see you until January. And in the meantime, I think you, you should gather up your family, your relatives, those who love you, and talk about this because you didn't cause your husband's death, nor did you cause the, your uh, husband's dog's death. But talk to people and seek the help and maybe be a little bit more proactive in getting help with your doctor because you have a crisis in your, and you need help right now. And I think you should be proactive in getting that help and calling him personally, your physician or the, perhaps a physician extender that works in that office to sit down with you and talk about it. It's too long of a time to wait. You need help now mm -hmm. and you need to reach out at this, at this difficult time for you. Yeah, I, I couldn't concur more. I, I think that uh, her voice and just the, uh, the tremendous um, grief that she's feeling right now, she does sound like she's in crisis and there are uh, mental health emergencies. Uh, uh, emergency physicians take care of enormous amounts of disease and processes, but they're also able to, to, to identify patients who are in a mental health crisis and may need emergent therapy. So, um, you know, certainly, Cora, if there's um, feelings that she's going to hurt herself um, or these, this hopelessness has gotten to the point where she feels it's uncontrolled, and she cannot get to her physician. There are places, uh, our emergency departments are well staffed uh, to deal with mental health emergencies. But she needs a good support network around her to make Absolutely. this a lot easier on her. Absolutely. And January's too long to wait. January's no. too long. True, right. I'll, I'll agree with that. Let's go back to the phones. We'll talk to Mimi in Scranton. Mimi, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, Mimi. Hello. Um, uh, my breath. I'm sorry. No, take your time, Mimi. Okay. My brother and I were estranged for about 10 years, and we could never reconcile. I tried to reach him, call him, wrote letters, but he would not have, you know, he would not respond. He felt that we had not been supportive of him. And so 10 years go on, and there really was very little contact. I opened the paper one morning and I read of his obituary, and he did not say that he had left his two. He had two sisters surviving, and it just devastated me. That why did he feel this way when we could never seem to reconcile? And I just want to know what how I can deal with this. Thank you, Mimi. Um, does anyone have any good advice to Mimi how she could deal with this? And sorry about that loss, uh, Mimi. That's that's no way to find out. But uh, I think Mimi can take pride in, in that she tried to reach out to her brother uh, and um, it's not uh, the fact that it was her fault if you will but um, there's probably a lot of complicated interactions here and but she tried to make that connection I think she could feel comfortable in that uh, she had an honest effort to you know make amends um, and again maybe uh, the support of her her family to reassure her that uh, she is a good person, and that um, she is. It's not all always your problem. It's perhaps the other person's problem, even though that person now no longer is on this earth. I also think this is a kind of really hard thing that um, religious and spiritual support is really important for. So if she has um, a, a pastor or a priest or someone that she is involved with, that can be hugely important um, support for. Let's go back to the uh, phones. We'll talk to George in Alden. George, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you for taking my call. It's a great topic and uh, 
you're handling it really well, Joe. Good job. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I, my question to the panel, my father died uh, about four years ago, and it fell upon me to kind of handle all the arrangements. Uh, I gave the eulogy and, uh, you know, take care of my mom, things like that. And, and I never... I, I never cried, I guess, and I'm wondering, did I grieve or, or you know, I, sometimes I wonder, did I handle it just like a business transaction, and is that normal? I mean, do, do you have to cry and break down, or or is what I did a proper way of grieving and handling it? George brings up a good question. We all grieve in different ways. We learned this at the beginning of the program, but does someone have to grieve in the form of crying? Uh, do they have to become upset? I don't. I don't think necessarily. I, I think, uh, Jerry, you said it there, there, and the panelists have said it. There is no right way to grieve. It's a process that has to happen. Uh, it's often, you know, with intense emotion. Uh, but you know, the physical nature of crying um, is very individual. Um, you know, uh, you can, some people will have a very low threshold to shed a tear, whereas others, that threshold is very high, or may not be part of them, and they may not. Um, shed tears as a sign of their grief. Um, uh, I, I don't think that it, um, you know, negates the fact that he is grieved. And, and I, I would see if, if my, our panelists would agree or disagree with that. I think he worked through his grief yeah. by the eulogy, by taking care of the business at hand, and uh, that's a, a normal way of handling grief. Um, later on, perhaps when the things settle down, the dust settles and and uh, the estate's established or, uh, you know, the business uh, end of it is done, you probably might feel other forms of grief at that point. I, uh, I, I, agree. I would not underestimate the value of ritual, right. <laughs> of religious ritual. There's something to be said for the mass and the eulogy and the, you know, whatever religion or religious uh, um, we said earlier the culture used. could definitely play a big role. Absolutely, right? and sometimes they allow people to have a formal way to cope with, with their loss. And so I think we sometimes underestimate the value of those things. I think the one thing that people around um, the caller should, should be wary of is if they don't see tears, that you should not automatically you know, assume that his grief isn't real, isn't very deep, and so forth. And as far as you know, spirituality goes, I, I could not agree more. There's, there's such solace in um, people's faiths and their belief systems as far as you know, trying to really understand death beyond the physical nature of it. So um, you know, that too can help our caller quite a bit. I have a great quote I want to actually read about other forms of loss because we don't want to just keep the death part. It's, we're dealing with death and loss. It's never easy when a marriage or other significant relationship ends Whatever the reason for the split and whether or not you wanted it, the breakup of a long-term committed relationship can turn your whole world upside down and trigger all sorts of painful and unsettling feelings. But there are things you can do to get through this difficult time. Even in the midst of the sadness and stress of a divorce or breakup, you have an opportunity to learn from the experience and grow into a stronger, wiser person. I mean, we're talking about death and, and a lot of these, but again, we could talk about loss. We talked about it with children. We're going to go over those do's and don'ts in a little bit. Uh, but we talked about there are other ways, and in, in, in this, in marriage itself, is, is, is a huge bond to that, that, that uh, throughout that loss itself can be very traumatic, and you don't have to lose someone, but you lose part of your life, per se, mm -hmm. that you've had those many, many years. Uh, let's go back to the phones and, and see what uh, Claudia in Honesdale. Claudia, are you on the line? Yes. Go ahead. Your question, Claudia? Yes. Um, my question is, um, I'm, I'm wondering, well, so all of my siblings, there's seven of us in our family. Our father had passed away three years ago from colorectal cancer. And then our mother was diagnosed with the same thing. And, but she also has um, problems. She's uh, got diabetes and she has uh, kidney dialysis and she's got Parkinson's. And uh, my younger brother, He's been there through the passing of our father, and then he's going to be there for the passing of our mother, and because they both chose to pass at home. And my brother basically put his life, you know, on hold, which he didn't mind doing. I mean, our, our, our seven kids wish we could have done that, but in today's world, it's hard to, to do that. But 
What we're concerned about is our brother, uh, our youngest brother, is the more sensitive one, and he takes um, he, his grief is like you know strong, and I, we're wondering like how we're going to be able to help him deal when the passing of our mother happened, and then he, he's going to definitely feel the loss because. You know, he, he has dedicated his life to taking care of both of our parents, you know, during their passing. That's a great question. Yeah, Sorry. so um, he's lucky to have a sister like you and to have siblings who are worried about him and thinking about that. That's a blessing for him. I think you're right to be concerned because often a primary caregiver who is devoting their life to a loved one um, and especially one parent after the other, he is at risk. He needs extra support. So I think your awareness of that now and your um, focus on making sure that both before she goes and after she's gone, that you are there for him and that you're um, just present in his life. A lot of times uh, there's no way to make the sadness and hard hardness gone but the presence, just being with, just sort of um, going through this hard time alongside a loved one um, can be the strongest help you can give. So the, the love that you have for him and the relationship you have with him, um, that's, that's just a really important thing. While we're on support, Dr. Janoshek, why don't you read this graphic here for me and we'll talk about the do's for supporting someone. Um, express your care and concern Say that you are sorry about the loss. Say I love you if you feel close enough. Uh, talk openly and directly about the person who died. Cry if you feel like crying. Keep in mind that evenings, weekends, anniversaries, and holidays can be extra challenging times. Uh, doctor, would you like to read the next few? Behave naturally. Show genuine concern. Offer love patiently and unconditionally. Offer hugs or an arm around the shoulder as appropriate. Sit next to the person who wants closeness and make it clear that you are there to listen. Dr. Maffei, I'll have you do a couple more here for uh, some of the don'ts for providing support. You, you don't try to avoid the bereaved person. Uh, you don't try to pry into overly personal matters. Um, don't ask questions about the circumstances of the death, uh, but do be open to hearing whatever the bereaved person wants to talk about. Dr. Vanston? Don't offer advice or quick solutions. Uh, I know how you feel. Uh, you should blank, and time heals all wounds. I'll read this one, uh, another don't. Don't try to cheer up the person or distract them from the emotional intensity at least he's no longer in pain, I'm sure people say a lot, and she's in a better place now. And it was God's time, it's God's timing and his will. Uh, we also have don't minimize the loss. Oh, it's not that bad. You'll be okay, and things will go back to normal before you know it. I know a lot of times I've heard these around the office place or something when, when somebody dies. We do these things, and I don't think we mean to do them. It just kind of happens that, that it sounds like the you know, uncomfortable way to get out of the situation, and you don't know really how to, to you know, to support them, but there are logical ways to supporting someone, and there, there are wrong ways, and many people have to be educated on the right way to do it, because you can really hurt somebody's feelings, and we don't want to have that as a situation to it, but that's why I'm glad we were able to teach some of the do's and don'ts. But I think we're going to go back to Sandy, because the phone calls are backing up here. Sandy in Old Forge, you with us, Sandy? Yes. Go ahead, your question? Um, thank you for taking my call. Um, I was wondering if it's normal for me to feel more angry than sad. My mom died when I was pregnant with my daughter, Karina, and I was a lot more angry than sad, and I still am, and it's 17 years later. That's a great question. Well, uh, okay. I think um, uh, that's part of, uh, uh, of uh, when you first suffer a loss or perhaps being told that something bad is happening to you, I think the, there's a natural tendency to be very angry with, with the situation or the death or uh, whatever. Uh, usually that morphs into something more 
uh, existential, and 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 then you uh, you it, it, you'll be able to cope with that loss a little bit better. But it's quite natural to be angry, and even at this time, uh, after a few years after you know the situation when your mom died, uh, and you have to deal with that. And again, talking it out and over and with other people that you love and your physicians, if that gets to be your focus all the time, I think that's when it becomes pathologic, when the anger becomes pathologic, and you need to talk to somebody about it. Dr. Maffei, I have a graphic on children's uh, dues. I would like to have you read this for me, if you could. Uh, for children, uh, providing support includes uh, allowing the child who's age appropriate to attend services uh, if they indeed want to. If they do attend services, I would uh, stress the need for an adult to be with them at all times so that they can help answer questions or enable them to leave if it is overwhelming. Uh, convey spirituality values about life and death if it is part of the belief system of the family. Uh, meet regularly to find out how the child is doing and coping. Uh, pray with the child. Um, help children find ways to symbolize memorial and memorialize the uh, deceased person. Uh, pay attention to how the child is playing and interacting with uh, his uh, siblings and playmates to see if there's um, things that need to be addressed from a long-term standpoint if he's unable to engage and play in, a, in an appropriate period of time. Here's some of the don'ts. You want to continue with these? One thing you don't want to do is you don't want to hide death from uh, children. You want to be open and honest. Um, I, I'll add you don't want to use euphemisms. You want to be very careful not to say grandma's sleeping or grandma's gone away. It offers uh, nothing but confusion and sometimes even fear for the child. Uh, and don't tell the child to stop crying if that's what the child needs to be doing. Some more there? Don't force a child to publicly mourn and tell them when and how they should behave, um, you know, as far as crying and so forth. Um, uh, you shouldn't hesitate to, to, to allow your emotions to be seen in front of the child. You don't have to hide your grieving from the child. Um, and you don't want to turn the child into a personal confidant. Um, they may not be developmentally ready to you know, support another adult. Uh, it's probably best that that adult be supported by other adults in the family or uh, uh, palliative professionals. But knowing the correct way to support someone and that there are wrong ways. Yeah, is, is you have the, to be careful. Benefit of all this. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go back to the phones. We're going to talk to uh, Natalie in Kellers. Natalie, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Go ahead, Natalie. Yes, I'm here. And I, first of all, I want to say thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. Um, I noticed that you're talking about loss and they might be concentrating on death. And we have experienced those, but also I think one of the losses that children experiment the most is the divorce or the breakup of a, uh, of a marriage. And even though I'm trying to deal with a lot of those issues, my biggest concern or the question why I'm asking or calling it's because I don't know if it's only in the state of Pennsylvania or if it's across the nation that the laws were changed in obtaining counseling or mental health services for a teenager. Um, going through a situation, I just find out that the child, if they're 14 or over 14, they can sign their own consent and they can refuse the service if they don't want to. And as a parent, my question is, what do we do? Where do we turn? Who can we write to to try to correct that situation or to have um, the right individuals look into it so that we can really get the support and the services that we need, especially when we have the teenagers who are refusing to receive those services? Anyone want to? I don't know the ins and outs of the um, the laws. Uh, you know, we should have attorneys here to help answer that question. Yeah. The bigger issue is the 14-year-old who does not want to get that help and how to reach um, to that child. Um, if there are other non-parent adults who have relationships, sometimes that is hugely important. A kid who doesn't want to talk to mom or dad if they have a uncle or aunt or someone that they'll I talk to. I hate to interrupt you, but I would like to thank our panel members for joining us today, Dr. Yanishek, Dr. Maffei, and Dr. Nesbitt, and Dr. Vanston uh, for joining us. Uh, thank you to everyone at home. I'm Joe Krobach, and thank you for watching. Make sure you join us next week.
for another informative Call the Doctor.